Welcome everyone to tonight's presentation from the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. My name is Marisa Gomez. I'm the public programs manager at the museum and we are honored to have with us tonight, Adina Marenlinder, who will be sharing stories from her new book, Climate Stewardship, Taking Collective Action to Protect California, which she wrote with Brendan uh, Bueller. Before we dive into the program, I did want to get through a few housekeeping measures. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, and I first want to acknowledge that the land on which the museum resides and um, the land on which I am streaming in from is the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe. Today, these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsun tribal band who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward mother earth and all living things through relearning efforts in the Amamutsun land trust. Also again, um, we'll be communicating with you tonight via the chat and we would love to hear from you. So if you could send your messages to everyone, that would be great. Um, and maybe we could take a moment uh, to have you practice that. I imagine there might be some California naturalists in the audience. So another thing you can do is if you are a California naturalist, uh, let us know when you got your certification and from where, and also you can just share where you're uh, tuning in from. And at this point, I would like to formally introduce our speaker. So let's see if we can bring her in. There she is. Hello, Adina. <laughs> so Adina Marenlinder is a cooperative extension specialist at UC Berkeley and is an internationally recognized conservation biologist who has authored over 100 works in the field of conservation science. And she also, as I've kind of alluded to, started the California Naturalist Program serving as its founding director, which to date has graduated over 4,000 certified California naturalists, including myself. Um, <laughs> and building on the success of that program, she helped start the first public education and service program on climate stewardship, including writing the book that is the subject of tonight's presentation, Climate Stewardship, Taking Collective Action to Protect California, which I have right here, and which we also have in our store at the museum. So I'll make sure to put a link for that if you'd like to get a copy um, tonight, which you should. I've been uh, digging through it and I am already loving it. Um, and also I just wanna say, like I mentioned, I'm a certified California naturalist. I completed the program through the UC Santa Cruz Arboretum and Botanic Garden in 2018, I believe. And it was a incredibly formative experience that I, recall constantly in my current role at the Museum of Natural History. So Adina, I am just personally very excited um, to have you here. And uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll find a way to, to talk about the program during our Q&A uh, session too. But um, at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And after you're done with your presentation, we'll be able to get to everyone's questions. So if you do have questions throughout, just drop them in the chat or the Q&A and we will definitely get to them. Great, thanks so much, Marissa. I'll, I'll just take it from here. Um, excited to be here. Thank you to Marissa, who's uh, gone out of her way to get all this stuff set up. And thank you to everyone who's joined us online tonight uh, from the museum community. It's just really wonderful. Love Santa Cruz, love the museum. So this is fun for me too. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. So this will be, who can share? I think. Oh, that's probably, let me, sorry. <laughs> oh, I think I've got it. Let's okay. try. That's probably me. Let's get rid of that window. Let's go to full screen so y'all can see this. Let's see. Looks good. How's that, Marissa? Looks good. Good. Okay. Well, tonight we are going to talk about climate stewardship, uh, the way that I think we need to move forward as communities. Uh, you're looking at some wonderful paintings, watercolors from Obi Kaufman. So shout out to Obi for working on the project for this. We really appreciate having his artwork in the book, the kind of artistic interlude. I also want to acknowledge where I am connecting from, which is uh, at the Hopwood Research and Extension Center, where we first and foremost want to acknowledge with honor the Shokwa and Hopwood people whose traditional ancestral and unceded lands we work, educate, and learn and whose historical and spiritual relationship with these lands continues to this day and beyond. And it's been just a real pleasure to work with the Hopland Band of Pomo Indians here. So um, with that, 
Uh, I'm actually going to ask you all who are sit if you're sitting at a computer. <laughs> um, and Marissa, do you want to put the link in while I shift to the results? Yeah, it is so, in there. It's in the chat. Right. We're going to share this link, which is a poll. And the question for you to enter if you're at a computer is what are you or your communities experiencing that is connected to climate change? And then I am going to take a minute to show you what comes up if you do the poll. I will make sure. Does it seem to be working for you, Marissa? Yep. I'm trying to oh. fill it out right now. <laughs> Good. Hmm. I bet you pushed submit, Marissa, and I didn't get it. Say, see responses, Let's see if that helps. Did you push submit, Marissa? Yes, I pushed submit. And hmm. someone's asking that we put it in with a HTTPS, so here. It is again, right. so it's clickable. We'll make it a little easier. But the things that I wrote in, maybe I'll share. Um, yes, and I will try again to. Um, yeah, so the things that, that first come to mind to me are um, sea level rise. We're right on the coast in Santa Cruz, um, where I am. And we have a climate action um, wing of our city that I know is particularly concerned with um, with sea level rise and what we can do to mitigate that. And then also we had uh, wildfires impact our community a uh, little over a year ago. So those are two things that come to mind for me. Yeah, right, there's right. my one. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, well, it's supposed to be a word cloud, but it, it doesn't <laughs> seem to be behaving as I would have expected. Eh. So we'll keep going. Yeah, well, and people, you can add them to the chat too if you want. Absolutely, to just, that would be awesome. Since it's not looking pretty, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a nice word cloud, but I'll have to work on that. <laughs> okay. Now we're just gonna adjust this window. I know you're seeing a bit too much for now. We'll get that back down and we'll get going. All right. All right, well, thanks for entering them in the chat. Sorry about the word cloud. So the book. Uh, one of the things I wanted to share with you all is a little bit about the philosophy that we took to the book and why. Um, because I know that all of you also interact with folks around the topic of climate change and environmental issues. And one of the things that we did with the book is we really tried to show, not tell people what's going on in climate stewardship. And there was a recent study that showed that even if you say scientists say, you know, you should. Uh, have a more plant-based diet or drive less. Um, when people are polled after they read those kinds of instructions of what they should be doing, um, they actually ended up in this research showing that they wanted, they did not want to do those things. They didn't. They sort of dropped their will in their willingness to do them. They were not supportive of envir pro-environmental candidates and other things. And so, really, it's kind of revealing that even if you believe that something should be done. There's something about being told to do something that can have the reverse effect. Also, we really worked on a narrative for the book. So research shows that if you're reading a narrative as compared to, let's say, a scientific reference text, a little more like what we did for California Naturalist Handbook, people are willing to read twice as much and they retain twice as much. 
Um, also taking advantage of place-based and local phenomena around climate change is super important. It's really hard for people to connect if the context is out of area. Uh, also, um, messengers matter. And so we try to talk to a lot of different people. I talked to a lot of different folks in different types of communities in different parts of the state. Um, people identify with folks and connect and take in information, depending on if they feel that they are sharing an identity with that messenger or that sharing a worldview or values. So that is what kind of determines whether people see somebody as a trusted messenger. And lastly, I just want to say that the examples are intended to be, like I said, local and tangible and actionable. And hopefully people can see opportunities that they could get involved in, similarly to what the people are doing that we talk about in the book. Lastly, I just want to point out that Climate Storage is an education and service program, much like California Naturalist Program. And we started it in, uh, with a Climate Corps team, including Sarah Mae Nelson, who's been running the program, and Greg Ira, who's the now director of California Naturalist. One of the things that was clear to us is we really can't rely on nation states to address climate change. I think we are realizing that we're already on Conference of Parties 26, and we're seeing the emissions continue to rise. Um, so we really wanted to build some uh, capacity and help communities to organize around taking action together at the community scale and kind of a collective action approach uh, rather than focusing on individual behavior change. Uh, in part, sometimes individual behavior changes can be a burden. I know for myself, when I bring home something and maybe there's more packaging than I expected or something, I sort of beat up on myself. Why did I do that? And all of that. And so sometimes it can be difficult and lead to this defeating feeling of defeatist or like despair. So really we're working and sure, maybe people can put solar panels on their individual homes, but we're really focused on, for instance, setting up community choice aggregation and you working with community members to make sure that there's clean energy for all. I'm going to talk a little bit about drought. I'm thinking that if I could have seen that word cloud, <laughs> there might have been some people who thought that part of the way they're experiencing climate change is uh, in the recent drought and not and in not so distant past continued droughts that we're experiencing. And uh, obviously drought is accompanied with warmer temperatures and changes in precipitation, right? So we generally have in a drought less light rainfall and less snowpack. Um, and all of this results in something that some of you may have heard of called climate water deficit, which is basically how the soil um, is expressing the dry conditions and how plants are receiving this impact of drought. So it's basically the difference between how much water plants would use if they could have as much water as they want um, versus how much is actually available to them. And another way to think about climate water deficit, if you're a gardener, is how much do you have to apply, how much irrigation do you have to apply for that plant to be happy? And one of the interesting things that happens is in California around native plant communities and natural ecosystems was observed by Susan Harrison, who did some work, um, a long-term studies of value of ecological long-term research, and she monitored these herbaceous communities out in McLaughlin Reserve, which is in Lake County. And what she found there is that she was able, um, she didn't detect an effect on grazing over the long term. She had grazed and ungrazed plots. She had serpentine soil plots and non-serpentine soil plots. And all in all, what she found is that it was these periods of dryness that were leading to the loss in the community diversity of these plant communities in particular uh, species that have like um, large leaf areas. So fleshy plants, <laughs> you know, when you look at them, you think they need more water, they're not drought tolerant. And so she actually found that those types of plants um, were experiencing, she was losing those out of her plots um, and they were going locally extirpated because of drought. Uh, so it's a thing that we're worried about, this sort of like precipitation whiplash that we're experiencing under climate change is leading to periods of drought and then, uh, you know, episodic, very big atmospheric rivers. 
Um, lastly, I'll just say that the folks at McLaughlin and working with community members have been hard at work trying to minimize the competition of the fresh water in the soil um, by removing a lot of annual invasive grasses that suck up a lot of water in order to try to make this ecosystem where they are more resilient to continue drying. I'm gonna talk a bit about wetlands and restoration in wetlands. And one of the sites that I think sort of reveals it all is if those of you who've ever driven down Highway 37 or from Marin County uh, east or to Vallejo or, or back again, um, you go through this low wetland. Um, you can often smell the <laughs> tidal events and also was actually closed. It was actually closed for, um, I think it was almost 28 days it was closed. So it was a huge, and when, when it was flooded at one point, yes, 28 days of closure in the floods that happened between 2016 and 2017. Um, so this combination, what was is this combination of surge uh, with the waves. So, and uh, an atmospheric river passed through um, and all sort of at the same time, so you know, they had king tides, storm surge and atmospheric river at that time between 20 in the winter of 2016, 2017, it resulted in this very long flooding period and closure. Um, so this has been an area not only for the people been working on around wetland restoration because of the value that wetlands bring as natural filters, buffering sea level rise, sequestering carbon. I always think it's amazing that more carbon is sequestered per acre in wetlands than forests. And of course provides incredible habitat um, for birds and plants, other things. Um, one of the tricky things about wetlands and stu stewarding wetlands is that with too much disturbance, the microorganisms in those waterlogged soils can start to respire. And when they start to do that and become active, then, they, then a lot of methane can also be released, which is of course a, a much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide. But in general, if, um, if they're left um, undisturbed, uh, then generally the um, anaerobic processes don't uh, release as much methane and a lot of carbon dioxide can be stored. All right, so getting to who's been busy over there in those wetlands near Highway 37 is an amazing group of kids over the years. Actually, since 1992, this program called STRAW has restored 650. They've been involved in 650 restoration projects and over 40 miles of Creek Bank have been restored. And, the, and all, a lot of this is going on in that area of, of Southern Marin County. Um, and that, you know, is in part thanks to Lorette Rogers, who used to be a school teacher when she started the program with fourth graders and then became a staff member at Point Blue and continues to work with classroom teachers to bring kids out, um, just like this young fellow who says, I helped put some of these trees in. And so I feel like I have this connection. And it's also involved with private landowners in getting this, this street creeks and wetlands restored. I think we can appreciate that we want everyone who wants to be involved, I mean, all welcome to working in these wetlands and in this same area in Richardson Bay, right where we're talking about now, is a big baylands restoration project that was going on. And thanks to Veronica Miranda, um, she, she's working with Latina, Latino Outdoors to ensure that family groups from her communities can come out, work on restoring the land, camping, uh, learning about nature in these uh, in Richardson Bay. Um, and it's interesting to think that Miranda's first time out doing ecological restoration involved controlling the spread of invasive species. Um, so she knows a lot about invasives and gets uh, families and friends out to help her out. She says the key to successful community building is making sure you create a safe place and inclusion for everyone, regardless of what they're called or what they come out for from or where they come from or their age, it's you are a human being, come join us. One of the places that you all I'm sure are familiar with is the amazing opportunity to restore some of the wetlands in Coyote Valley. 
and to add to the habitat connectivity uh, from the Santa Cruz Mountains um, to the east. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a group working on that effort that connects wetlands with larger landscape habitat connectivity. And I personally, as a conservation biologist, do a lot of work on climate smart ha habitat connectivity and had the good fortune of working a bit on Coyote Valley. Um, I think traditionally we think about corridors as sort of the solution to habitat fragmentation, um, linking isolated patches of habitat together. Um, and yes, that does help with daily movements, with gene flow, seasonal migrations, and to increase the viability of populations. And increasingly under rapid climate change, we are looking to habitat connectivity as a way of species shifting their ranges to adapt to rapid climate change and to add into resilient uh, landscapes. So I talked with Susan Butler Graham and some of you may know her who's with Mothers Out Front. And one of the things that really struck me was what Susan said about before she joined this group working on climate change, and I'll tell you a little bit about their efforts in Coyote Valley, and after. So she said, before I joined the group, I would get panicked, and then I would go into denial because I could not sustain that level of anger and sadness and worry about what I'm going to say to my kids in 10 years. Joining a group is essential. Then you get fortified, hearing about what other moms are doing. It's contagious. Now, I don't have to go into denial and shut down. I can say, yes, this is horrible. And yes, it is scary, but I'm doing everything I can. So being part of this group has really transformed um, life for Susan. Um, and I think that was a lesson that I heard from a lot of people I talked to who do climate stewardship. They're like, I just feel better knowing I'm doing something and doing it with others and have that support network. Um, and these folks did just really embrace Coyote Valley as a priority. They get together and decide their priorities every year. And the perspective on Coyote Valley was San Jose, you know, they basically thought the wildlife corridor was so important because once it's gone, it's gone. That's what she said. It's gone and this urgency sealed it for her to pitch in and save Coyote Valley as a wildlife corridor. So, you know, for them, it was just a very pressing issue that rose to the top for their group. And they spoke to a lot of people on the city council and they got kids involved in speaking to the city council. They wrote postcards and delivered them on Mother's Day <laughs> about Coyote Valley and just really put like a community, common community vision really came to life with this group. Yes, there were a lot of organizations and agencies involved in this and tons of people and lots of scientists. But I really believe that corridor implementation, and we even wrote a paper about this because we did a bunch of surveys of what makes for really um, good outcomes with putting wildlife corridors in and a common, commu common community vision and community behind the effort was a, a leading reason for success. So it takes a lot for a kid to come speak in the city council about animals and their future, said Susan. So, you know, it's not, an easy thing for the kids or for the moms, but it was very, very successful. And the city council, some of you may know, approved a $93 million deal to protect 937 acres in Coyote Valley as a Coyote Valley corridor. And it continues to be a very successful effort. And for those who are working on it out there, thank you. It's a very exciting effort that is gonna build climate resilience, wetland recovery and wildlife movement. It's wonderful. And I'm just gonna close out with a little bit about oceans because you all are there and some local situations that I bet um, some of you are familiar with who are in Santa Cruz. <clears throat> this is a, one of my favorite paintings that Obi did for the book. It's this little fish swimming through the waves of kelp. Um, we call this one of the stories around kelp. There's quite a few ocean stories, but one of the stories is called No Bird Food in the Blob. And some of you experience, I'm sure, the marine heat wave. Um, and you might have even remembered that in 2014, you could go out and like swim without a wetsuit, which was super crazy. Um, these marine heat waves um, can hit us, particularly when we go into like a cycle of high pressure weather, and they can create the conditions for these marine heat waves and that basically block storms and blocks windy weather, that high pressure. 
And normally those winds and storms would actually lead to the mixing of surface water and deep pool water. But in this case, if those storms are blocked, then the mixing doesn't happen and nutrient and the stagnant warm water sort of stays offshore and prevents a lot of fish species from remaining off uh, the coastline of California. They tend to move up into colder north into colder waters. And we also had a fairly big um, north, um, another big marine heat wave in 2019 as well. So scientists know and predict in the climate change forecasting that such a, these kinds of heat waves will become more frequent and have a profound effect on the ocean environments of California. Um, well, it's hard to get in there and get your hands dirty and try and recover these shorebirds that need food um, offshore. So we want to do everything we can to uh, protect these shorebirds. And one of the things that's going on with volunteers, as um, Daniel Robinette said from Point Blue, we just went out to Surf Beach as out at Ecosystem store as ecosystem storage with orange vests and an A-frame sign that said, ask me questions. And basically there are volunteers out talking to the public about uh, shorebirds um, and trying to set up areas and exposures where people shouldn't go to protect their nesting habitat. They also go out on boats and count birds on offshore islands. So there's all kinds of sort of yeah, as we all know, there's tons of people who love birds <laughs> and um, lots of volunteers who are monitoring uh, shorebirds. That makes a big difference for people being able to count them and determine how they are responding to these periods of low food availability. Some of you may know Janina Lorenas. She um, actually is a certified California naturalist from UC Santa Cruz Arboretum and an amazing printmaker and community um, civic engagement. And she actually ended up starting to dive at the same year that she did her certification for California naturalist. And it was all at the same time that the blob had arrived. Um, and she, you know, this is, here's a quote from her. My first year when I would go out diving, we would go places that were pretty barren and people would just be devastated and talk about how just a year or two ago, it was dark underwater because of the dense kelp canopy. So um, Janina does uh, learn how to dive and does volunteer citizen monitoring um, of kelp beds and offshore. Um, basically, they do all kinds of measurements that have to do with the species that they're observing, as well as the physical parameters underwater. Uh, she works with Reef Check California to do that with others and a really safe pair, they go out in pairs and do these underwater surveys. Um, and all of this is to say that part of what happened with the blob, I think many of you know, is that we lost a lot of abalone. Um, and then of course we had starfish wasting disease and we have urchin invasion. So it's a cascading food web problem that resulted from these warm currents. Um, the picture of the diver is actually R.J. Rafferty, who volunteer dives for California Fish and Wildlife. Um, I just saw him the other day, and he updated me that he was off the Channel Islands um, trying to find any white abalone that they could. And unfortunately, they did not find any white abalone. Those are being propagated now at Bodega Bay Marine Lab. And there's a whole part in this uh, book that talks a lot more about what RJ and Janina are doing um, in ocean conservation. Uh, this uh, slide is um, a little introduction to Alicia Cordero. And uh, Alicia works for an organization that is called the Wish Toyo Foundation, Wish Toyo Chikamesh Foundation. She actually started with her colleagues at the foundation, a California naturalist um, course that's co-designed with them, um, filled with traditional ecological knowledge and around their community um, ecocultural species and kinds of activities that are in line uh, with their uh, traditional practices. <clears throat> I'm gonna just take this opportunity to read a little bit from the book and then we should be good. 
Um, so Alicia Cordero refers to abalone as a cultural keystone species. When they are removed, the parts of the culture organized around them break down. The idea of a cultural keystone is analogous to the ecological concept of keystone species as critical for all structure and function of an ecosystem. Black abalone were particularly important to the Chumash because they were widely available and easy to gather from shallow waters. Red abalone, the most common, as well as the largest of the seven native California abalone species matter too. Alicia says, in addition to food, abalone shell is a really important part of our material culture. Our regalia is just one example of where we highlight abalone culturally. We call it our bling and it's beautiful to be covered in it. It's really important to our hearts, to our ceremony and to our food systems. Alicia says that when indigenous Californians cannot participate in traditional ecosystem management, it creates an ongoing sense of displacement, erasure and cultural loss that leads to negative mental health outcomes and decreased community well-being. This argues for the importance of supporting California indigenous people practicing traditional management and participating in decision-making that impacts their ancestral homelands. So with that, I would just say that there are about 55 more stories or more, we have over 60 stories in the book um, coming from different voices and different places and different ecosystems. Uh, and we're trying to weave the relevant climate science and justifications for why people are doing what they're doing out there throughout. Um, so I hope you take time to take a look at the book and I hope that it'll inspire you uh, to take action. Thank you. Thank you, Adina. Um, we do have some questions that have come through, but I just wanna start by saying that, you know, both in hearing these stories from you and also um, reading some of them in the book too, I was struck by how, um, A, like how many of the people I've already heard of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that, that they're, they're people that I already know of doing this great work. And it just made me think of all of the other people and all the other organizations that, I mean, I get the opportunity to, um, to work around with what I do, but also I think for people within my own community um, are familiar with. So I thought it might be uh, nice. I, some people have already started adding some, um, some things in the chat. Um, but if you also, uh, if you're attending tonight and there are organizations or people from your community that you think are worthy of being included in a book like this, then I think we'd love to hear from them. So maybe take a moment, um, to write that down. Um, but I wanted to, uh, talk a little bit about Janina, one of the people who you just, brought up because she does uh, live in Santa Cruz and she's someone who the museums actually worked with. And so I was delighted to see her featured um, in the book. And I've gone to community outreach events where she's done the screen printing projects that she describes in that section of the book where one of the prints is beautiful and it says, um, uh, the sea is rising and so must we. Um, and one of the things that uh, you guys touch upon in that section is, the idea of capitalism because the other poster that she has people make at those events is one that says capitalism is killing us. <laughs> um, and there was just a quote that I wrote down from that section. It says a societal model that requires endless growth conflicts with the finite resources of earth and its biosphere. And I was just wondering if you could expand upon that concept a little bit more. Um, it just seems like a complex thing for us to wrap our heads around, but maybe a very important um, piece of, of understanding issues of, uh, of climate change in our society. Great, yeah. I mean, I'm really crazy about donut economics. So if you don't know about that, check it out with Kate Wentworth. But um, she's a British economist who's trying to, what I like about her work is that she's trying to present alternatives to capitalism that are uh, recognizing planetary boundaries, right? And are about health and not just infinite growth. And she has, you know, mechanisms to get there. So um, definitely check out Donut Economics. She has a lot of graphic um, animated little videos about you, what You're it saying is. donut, like D-O-N-E-T? Donut, like a donut okay. want to eat. <laughs> I'm, I'm hooked already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So instead of talking about it like, 
theoretical concent concentric circles, you know, she just calls uh -huh. it donut economics. <laughs> but you know that there are these planetary boundaries and that we have to keep our activities within what our systems and complex systems can, can handle. So it's very much, yes, Kate Merriweather, thank you. Um, so anyway, I definitely check that out. Um, Janina is great. I think it's neat that she's really getting people involved. I think that there's, when we talk about the California Naturalist Program, we talk a little bit about people being different. Like some people are in their heads, some people very much heart, um, hands, and Jose Gonzalez from Latino Outdoors always says, and feet, which I think he means like, they just need to move and do the action, like, you know, very, very action oriented. But um, your know, hands are like a lot of people like to do, you know, land stewardship. So I, I like the print because like you're you're involved with your hands making print, um, uh, but also engaging your mind obviously on um, solutions that to, and yeah, I think it's clear that we've gone crazy with infinite growth and haven't really paid attention to Earth systems responses and uh, what Earths and what the whole community of life actually needs. Um, and how we need to pay more attention to that, or we're just gonna run away in a not a good way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, and I love the how you shared um, about Janina using her talents because she is an artist. And um, just for those of us thinking about, well, how do we plug in to this? And maybe starting with, well, what do you like, <laughs> and how do you want to spend your time? Um, which you know, makes me think about those tenants that you started us off with of like, what does it need to be in order to be um, uh, a plan that will work that people will buy into, and that basically like it needs to be relevant and needs to be something that um, that aligns with what they already what their lived experience is. Um, and so, you know, it seems like starting there is a good, good place to start. You don't have to like hear all these stories of people doing things like maybe scuba diving, which you're like, I can't scuba dive. I don't <laughs> want to do that. But it's, you don't have to, you just think about what it is that you, how you do like to spend your time and how can that be translated into. Right. Um, and I love change. these community action groups. We talk about Mendocino Climate Action and Palm Springs Climate Action Group, because um, I think getting together with a group of folks and then bringing into that group, what is it that you do care about? What is it you do want to work on? And then grabbing a few members of that group to, to make it happen. So it's happening beyond your own sphere, you know, it's slightly larger and more transformative. Um, so yeah, those groups are fun because they every year sit down and say, what does everybody want to do? And, you know, they have different ideas and not everyone in the group participates in everything. Some people might be working on a microgrid other people might be working on some fire safe issues, but, um, generally if you can bring your own ideas into the group and recruit a few friends, yeah, uh, th that really helps. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. I feel like um, I've been in a lot of those, you know, conversations or like idea phases of like, ah, oh, if we could just do this, but what really it takes in order for those things to actually happen is that you've got to get other people on board and it really, like it, and it doesn't take a huge group. If you just have like a couple other people <laughs> that like want to pursue something with you, all of a sudden, um, you know, things things can happen. Um, but so that really has appealed to me from the way that this book is all set up. And speaking of which, so we're talking about this climate stewardship book, and I'll put the link in the chat. But then there's also this other reason. So this was kind of brought out of the, the new climate steward program. That's sort of like an offshoot of the California naturalist program. And so this is the handbook for the California naturalist program. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about like, the decisions that were that went into going this route you know if that yeah <laughs> yeah it's really different and I have to say some people complain about the naturalist handbook that it's not enough storytelling and you know part of that might be just my own evolution <laughs> as a scientist um and interacting with more people um but but part of it is the class and what people need for that particular mm -hmm. program and it was pretty clear that a reference text would be a real contribution to the naturalist program because while there's like a ton of material out there, it can be really overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to figure out like, how can we give people something that's like a 10,000 mile flyover, a natural history that it's just sort of the basis, a place to start from, a place to launch from. Um, 
and we do need to redo, you know, we need to update it. And so I bet we will add like, for instance, there are sidebars and things like that. And I suspect we'll try and add a little more narrative to the sidebars just to make it a little stickier and easier to retain. Um, but we did want a book that you could look things up in the back, learn them, go back to where it was about all the, you know, geology or other terminology. We wanted people to sort of have in common as members of, you know, of, as being a certified California naturalist. Mm -hmm. And um, climate search is just so different. It was always from the beginning about community bridging relationship. Um, the science moves really fast. Um, so, you know, we're already preparing our fifth um, assessment for California, right? Um, climate change assessment. So every time we have a new assessment, we are learning new information. So we put that kind of thing on the online content for the class. We also really knew that people just needed to be inspired, that people were down about this topic. Like, we don't have to like pump up the naturalists. You know, usually, I mean, yeah. there are <laughs> no doubt environmental impacts are all dealing with losing our species, the monarchs. I mean, we can go there for sure. But in general, when we're talking about our practice or things we really love to learn, it's very much mm -hmm. um, something that we want to engage in. If we had come at climate science that way, just like everything we know about climate communication would say, do not write a reference text about climate change in California. Like it's too, um, it'll get stale and it's um, not, it, you know, nobody wants to deal with it. It's too upsetting. So yeah, so we're dealing with those different contexts of information, different purposes of the book. Lastly, I'll just, you know, shout out to Brandon Bueller, my co-author, because uh, I'm not a narrative writer and it took somebody who was willing to collaborate and sort of in science art collaboration. So I wrote the whole first draft and then Brendan was trying to like really work the narrative to try and keep it moving um, and keep it, yeah, flowing mostly. And a little bit of humor that he has a gift for. Yeah, um, it's written beautifully and it does, it's a very easy read. Um, yeah, so that's, problem. you know, that's Brendan. He definitely can do that. And that was really fun to see him do that. And then at the same time, I'm like trying to do these deep dives on warm water temperatures, and <laughs> not lose everyone. Yeah, it's yes, I, I relate to that challenge um, in my line of work, too. And I um, since we're talking about the Naturals program and the climate stewardship program, there are some um, there have been some comments in the chat about um, those programs. And, and Kat noted that the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History will be offering the California Climate Stewards class in in. 2022. Um, it's not up on this website yet, I don't think, but this is the um, the website to learn more about that. So if you are interested in um, joining a class, you can find which ones are being offered there. Um, and then the California Naturalist program also has, um, I'll find the link for that another time, um, but that yeah. we have one at the Pacific Grove Museum of Natural History and then in Santa Cruz where I am at the um, UC Santa Cruz Arboretum and Botanic Garden, which is where me and Janina and like half of our staff at the museum <laughs> got our <laughs> naturalist certifications through. And um, that usually the applications for it open usually in February and then the program goes from April through June. Um, so that's another one um, to keep. Uh, yeah, it's been interesting, radar. you know, it was kind of interesting because we knew California natural history would be popular. I always feel like a desire to learn more about natural history, um, you cannot satiate that desire. People just want to learn more. And it's, I, I kind of had this sense that's going to be popular. Climate stores, I'm, I'm a little surprised how popular it is. Like people really want to start climate stores. They're different. Sometimes they're different people, which is perfectly fine. Different institutions, sometimes the same institutions. Um, but it's ramped up a lot faster than we expected. And so we, we've already surveyed post course surveys, like 164 climate stewards we just launched. And um, it's, it's interesting that the primary question that I got before we started climate stewards, but right when we were thinking about what to do was people asked, what can we do about it? Or what can my, I used to hear like, what can my little town do about it? I live in Mendocino County, there's a lot of small towns. No, but what can we as a small town do about it? And so I think this idea of action-oriented classes um, seems to have some appeal for, for those who are feeling that urge to really step in on this in this space. 
Um, so yeah, we're starting to teach it for Climate Corps, which is a young um, group of folks who are in a workforce education. We teach California Nachos to a lot of our Conservation Corps um, programs, and we're talking to them also about rolling out Climate Stewards. So it's also, um, it's great to work with all of our partners. It's a special, you know, privilege for us to try and roll things out for underserved young adults as well. So just so folks are know what's going on in the world of CalNet and climate stewards. Yeah, well, and I, I, I really appreciate hearing about that program again tonight because I, you know, I heard about it when I was going through the naturalist program and it hadn't launched yet. And they were looking for people who might be willing to be involved. It was kind of like how it was presented. And, you know, to me, having gone through the naturalist program, I was jazzed about geology and insects and like all sorts of things but like the idea of digging deeper into climate change was like not the area I wanted to go <laughs> after, <laughs> not your happy place um, yeah you know but I think but after kind of digging into it a little bit more deeply tonight and looking through the book um I kind of I view it differently now which is that it's actually a like a community um group opportunity it's and for someone like me that's like awesome I love the idea of it now this idea of like figuring out what is the right program and what is that what's the problem and what's the solution and what can we do and getting together with others and working on it together um so it actually yeah it's I I appreciate the approach of focusing on the action and the positive um because I you know even someone like myself I uh can find it to be something that I want to shy away from <laughs> You know. Yeah, yeah, we have the same response. Some of our own staff at CalNet, they're just like, ah, I thought we were going to be natural. <laughs> like, oh. Yeah, well, you know, and even the, you know, painful. Yeah, then the, the, the museum, the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History, where I work, our mission is connecting people with nature and science to inspire stewardship of the natural world. And it's something I've been thinking about with all of this is how, like, maybe the naturalist program is kind of like the first part of the mission that we have of connecting people with nature and science and just like, figuring out ways to make it relevant and engaging and getting people hooked. And then the second part, inspiring stewardship of the natural world is like, so now you care about it. Um, and what do you do? And that's what this is all about too. Um, and there are a couple of people uh, like Michelle, who um, seems to be based in Santa Cruz County and is starting um, a, a group and put a link in the okay. chat. Um, for that. And then someone also shared, maybe that was Michelle also. Um, yeah, the uh, Protect Eurostock group. And I want to note that, so that's um, a, a friends group in support of our local tribal band, the Amamutsin tribal band. And um, they are helping to support the tribe's efforts to um, halt uh, a gravel quarry going in on sacred land in Santa Clara County. And if you're interested in learning more about that group, um, they're actually going to be at the museum on this coming Saturday on December 12th from 10 to 2 for our winter open house. And they're going to have some like kids, kids activities to go along with it. So um, that's something that people um, in the Santa Cruz area can do. And we had one question come through from Heather. This came through when you were talking about connectivity of habitats in the Coyote Valley project. And this is kind of a complicated topic, I think. Um, so Heather is interested in why did wildlife ecologists, biologists allow the single male wolf to migrate down to Southern California from um, Oregon, knowing that no wolves would be in that direction. And according to Heather, allowing the wolf to walk into its demise by walking into traffic and being killed by a car. So like, where does that decision play into your understanding of these, you know, these efforts for connectivity and then um, extirpated species being reintroduced on their own accord in an environment where they won't be able to do much with that? Right, right. Well, wolves are expanding for sure, um, which I think is, is good news. Um, even without our interventions at this moment, um, well, you could consider our intervention to stop killing them so much. And so um, they are in recovery in a lot of places. And so even 
even without sort of thinking about it as a reintroduction, they are expanding. Um, as far as like, uh, I don't work for the Fish and Wildlife. Um, I, you know, as a conservation biologist, I don't actually think about intervening, like if an animal has a collar on it. So you all might know some of the work by like Chris Wilmers, who mm -hmm. collars a lot of mountain lions in your area. Like we don't think about putting collars on and then like manipulating the animals, you know, catching them again to stop them from engaging in what is sad to see their demise. It's just, it, it's an interesting framing. Um, it's not one that conservation biologists usually when they are studying animals think about doing um, as far as like, you know what I'm talking about? Like if, even if we are real time monitoring them, we wouldn't normally think about trying to get a crew or get a helicopter or whatever it would take to um, somehow recapture that animal. Um, as far as roadkill, yeah, it is just so sad and uh, really, really difficult. There's some citizen science and community science efforts around trying to prevent roadkill. Um, it's a really important problem. Fortunately, on a more positive note around Southern California, we do have you know, renewed funding for some major overpasses on those highways to the east side of Los Angeles and also to connect the Santa Monica Mountains. So I just think we really need to argue for these overpasses and try to protect animals as much as we can. Yeah, and I guess that that reminds me of like a part of the book talking about the different the different types of action that people can take, which we've talked about a little bit too. Like, okay, you can actually like do restoration work and get your your hands dirty, or you can do education. Um, but another aspect that we haven't talked about as much is like advocacy, I guess. Right. And like, um, so how how would you recommend people go about figuring out what are the steps that they want their community to take and then so what they should be advocating for like maybe right. they, I think they decided civic, like they want to go to city council but they don't really know yet yeah what civic engagement do. is super important one of the things we point out is how many citizen advisory committees there are out there and some of them have trouble filling and open board meetings for your community aggregated energy for your water um districts so we sort of talk we talk about people who go to those kinds of meetings and step up in that way. Uh, I also wanted to point out like surf riders is like one of the most effective um, groups that does policy change. Um, I didn't really realize how much, uh, how effective they are at getting new policies passed around ocean protections. And so those are, you know, an ocean enthusiasts who surf or paddleboard or walk on the beach. And what the power of them is that they really are united. And so when they decide to run a campaign and to get a policy protection in, they're very, very effective. Um, and they tr do trainings for how to go to city council meetings and things like that and represent on the issues that they're covering. So again, I just think it's super important, especially in civic engagement, to engage with a group um, who then take it on to say, we are going to you know, past, let's say, no leaf blowers like they did in Palm Springs, you know, solar panels on new construction. I mean, there's so many policies that we talk about in the book that have to do with your town council, city council, governing boards, um, that when the residents get active and show up, and you know it's really hard. I'm been there where I got kids at home and it's an evening meeting. We're all supposed to show up to do the something about trails and it's the agenda keeps getting pushed back till you're there hours texting your spouse and you're still waiting for your agenda item to come up you know and meanwhile the people who don't want the trail are being paid to be there so it's difficult it's really difficult but we have a lot of examples in the book where people are doing exactly that one of them is one of the examples is around wetlands in Los Angeles and wetland recovery. And it's just about meetings. It's about how they got lots of people to meetings and they got to know the folks who were in charge of the projects that they were trying to influence toward nature-based solutions instead of hardscaping. And through those meetings and through those relationship buildings, they were able to make tons of progress. So yeah, we're, you know, going in with others and coming up with a plan and showing up is super powerful, but yeah. it does require a tremendous amount of patience. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose too, I, I, reading the book is probably a great way of getting that kind of inspiration of like, 
you know, maybe mulling on the issues that you know of in your community already, or maybe you're not really as familiar, but like kind of seeing the stories from other communities and much like I felt reading it, um, saying, oh, I recognize that. Oh yeah, that's something similar to what we're doing here, even when it was a community that's not one that I'm familiar um, with. So I, I feel like this is a good, good source of inspiration. Yeah, and before I lose you all, I wanted to mention fire. I didn't talk about it today, yeah. but there's a lot on good fire in the book. And you know, it's very much on our minds. Um, and I just wanted to say that it's great to see that there's a Central Coast Prescribed Burn Association. Yeah. So it's such a good way that, you know, for people who are into the hands and getting out there with the feet, um, show up to what some of these prescribed burns and help out, even just bringing the potluck food at the end of the prescribed burn can help the prescribed burners. It's a real community effort to, to um, implement good fire. So. Yeah, well, and that's, and it is an, an area of, you know, we've been talking about like the social aspect of these like science issues. Um, and prescribed burns is one of those things where all of the people that I've talked to over the past, like not all of them, but a lot of the people that I've talked to since we had the CZ lightning complex fires mm. in uh, August, 2020, a lot of them have been social scientists that have been thinking about how do we get people to be on board with good fire? Because especially like after a catastrophic event too, you know, like associating fires negative thing is something that's likely to happen. But one thing that I learned from one of the social scientists that, um, that we've had on some of our programs is that right after a major fire event, um, people are all about prescribed burns actually, because they, you know, any solution and then it goes away. And so it's like really mm -hmm. important to leverage that time. And so the central coast prescribed burn association, like now is the time and they're doing stuff. And I actually was going to go on a, a burn with them this past weekend to see what it's all about myself and had to be canceled because of, um, weather quality issues, which often happens with that, yes. but I'll be happy to include a link, um, to them in my follow-up email as well. And maybe just any other, um, local organizations in Santa Cruz that I can, that I can think of, um, that relate to topics that we've been talking about today. Well, I can tell we at least inspired Marissa to send yeah. that, <laughs> some action items. <laughs> that, that's good. Well, and you know, in Santa Cruz where we are, and I'm, you know, I'm sure this is the same for, for all communities and I'm just biased, but you know, in Santa Cruz, I really am proud of the fact that we have so many, nonprofit organizations, community-led organizations that are all, that are about, you know, making positive change in their community. And a lot of them are focused on the environment. We have so many, um, and it makes it really easy for us at the museum to, you know, find great partners. Um, so. Absolutely yeah. the path to joy. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, great. I want to uh, thank everyone for joining us tonight. And um, let me, before I let you guys go, I'm going to include um, the link in the chat for the book. Um, so this one's for the, the climate stewardship book. And then in my follow-up, I'll also include a link for the California naturalist handbook too. Cause I know that it seemed like there was some interest in that book in the chat. Um, and some other resources will come as well as a survey. Um, we'd appreciate your, uh, feedback on how this experience went for you and what you'd like to see in future programs. And Adina, is there anything else that you'd like to Leave us hey, thanks everyone for coming out this evening. It's uh, coming online this evening. And I hope that I'll be in Santa Cruz soon and run into folks, maybe yeah. on a prescribed burn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it's just uh, an honor to meet the, the founder of the California Naturalist Program too, because it's such an important thing to me and I'm sure to some of the other people in the audience tonight too. So thank you for getting that started. It's been an inspiration. Uh, yeah, well, I wouldn't go anywhere without naturalists like you all. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have a statewide conference in October. I should give a big plug. So it's Yay! in Tahoe. A lot oh. of information is going to go out. So stay tuned on our website. Um, California Naturalists is organizing a statewide conference and it's, they're always really fun. Everybody gets to talk about what they do as a naturalist. We're going to have some superstars there for sure. So, and all of our wonderful superstar volunteers and oh, awesome. yeah, and, I, and, you know, one thing that you should note is that anyone who goes through the California Naturalist program, they have to do um, a, a form of service as part of their certification. So those 4,000 people, all of them have done something positive for the environment in California, which is really great. And I'm sure continue to after, after that initial certification. So, all right, well, I'll, I'll uh, certainly try to be there in October. And oh, good. Um, <laughs> thank good. you so much, Adina. And thanks yeah. everyone for joining us. 
Okay. Thank you. Have a good night.